All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Xavier Ducroy. Um, <clears throat> I'm the tech lead for the developer tools for Android at Google. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the, uh, the new component model that was shown yesterday by Luke. I don't know if you went to his sessions, but if you haven't, you should really uh, watch the recording. It was really good. Uh, and in the past several months, we actually worked very closely with the Gradle team to actually start using that component model in the Android plugin. Uh, it's a big use case for them because we have a fairly complex model. And I, I'm going to talk about that first, actually. So for those who are not super familiar with Android, um, you know, a lot of people, when they think about Android, they think about, you know, well, I code in Java, so, you know, easy, right? Uh, so in fact, you know, while you do code in Java, we have other languages, whether it's AIDL, run the script, or even native code, like most of the games are actually written in native code. Uh, we have a lot of custom steps. A lot of them are actually generating code. Uh, so when you compile run the script or AIDL, or even when you compile the resources, we have a custom resource mechanism. When you compile resources, you actually generate Java code too. And uh, you end up with a build uh, flow that sort of looks like that. There's actually a few steps that are missing from there. There's, we have a lot of like optional, like we are not showing, I don't think, we might be showing prog out here, but there's other steps that are you know, uh, there. And um, so that's just one aspect of it. Uh, the other aspect is that you know, when we talk to developers, we really had to design something that worked for them, because the previous version based on like Ant and just the internal builder of Eclipse just didn't work. So um, there are several aspects of Android that requires that. Uh, the first aspect of it is the security model, right? Your apps have to be signed. If you want to be able to debug your app, they have to be signed, preferably separate with a different key, right? You don't want the release key to be used during the development process. Uh, if you want to install a debug version and a release version side by side, there's some additional requirements. Um, then you have your whole development process, right? We hear a lot from developers that, you know, they have a backend, which not, used to not be the case. Like you know, 20 years ago, when we did back, uh, you know, desktop software. You know, there wasn't necessarily a concept of backend. But now, for Android application, most of them have a backend. Even a game will have a backend. And so, you want to have your QA version hit not necessarily your production backend, but like a separate backend and things like that. So there's a lot of requirement of making different versions. Uh, and then you have your business model. You know, whether you're doing, you know, we see a lot of app Android applications that have like a free, a free version, a paid version. And then there's distribution model where you, know, you have the Google store, you have the Amazon store, and potentially other things. And um, you know, when we talked with the Gradle team like, for the first time about like three years ago, uh, you know, we actually, you know, when I was looking at using Gradle or not, to, or first, the first thing that I did before talking with them was actually creating a model of what we want an Android application to look like. Uh, so the idea was to have ways for developers to say what they want to do in a very declarative way. And so we have this concept of build type, which is how an app is built. Uh, so that's your debug versus release. And you can have you know, dependencies that are build type specific, so separate dependencies for debug versus release. You can have separate source code or resources for debug versus release and things like that. And then we have flavors, which are you know, flavors of your app. So that's either your Google versus Amazon store version or your paid versus free. And if you have those two dimensions, then you can actually create dimensions of flavor. And, uh, and then we actually need to build something. And so we actually combine all of that together and we create what we call a variant, which is what you're actually trying to build. So what you're actually trying to build is, I want to build a version for the Google Play Store for the paid version of my app, but I want the QA version of it, or the debug version of it, or the beta version of it, or the release version of it. Um, and so this is something that you know, we, we kind of designed before talking to the Gradle team, and they said, you know, and said, sure, of course you can model it. No problem, right? You know, Gradle offers you like you know unlimited sandbox. You just go and you create your own model, and it just works. Um, but there's a lot of uh, you get a lot from that flexibility, but you also get a lot of issues where you know, like we, we introduced that plugin uh, the first time maybe about two and a half years ago, and then we have other plugin that depend on it, and then it's starting to be a bit messy. Um, so here's how you know variants are being combined. So here it's a very simple case. You have debug and release and you know you don't have any flavor and then you get a debug and a release so that's easy uh, if you had a free and a paid you get combination and then if you have another dimension you know I didn't want to draw a three dimension cube here so that's just the two slices of it you get eight, eight variants um, so here's an example of our DSA right and so Gradle you know that was one of the things that we really wanted from Gradle is you know when we talked with the, the team at the beginning was like we want to be able to model it and we want the DSA or you know or build files, whatever they are, to actually look like they are you know, very specific for our use case. So Gradle allows you to do that, and that's great. 
Uh, so we have an Android extension, and then everything under it is controlled by us. And so we have build types, you have product flavor, and you just do that, and that's easy, right? And so the way this is passed is, you know, that's, you know, as the DSL is passed, you kind of get a notification that, hey, we just added a debug to that build type. And the build type here is actually a name, domain name, object container, something like that. I suddenly forgot the name. And so the thing is that you have a, fit, you know, you have a callback saying, hey, we just added a new one and it's called debug. But it's actually added before you actually have, before it's configured, right? The closure for it that's configured is actually, you know, that's after you get notified. And so same thing for build type, uh, for product flavor. You get notified before. And in a very early prototype that we did, we tried to create the variant, so the combination of product flavor and build type as we would pass everything. And we found that to be very difficult because you kind of never know when you're actually done. And if you don't even know ahead of time whether you have one dimension of flavor or two, and if you start combining product flavor and dimension before you know how many dimensions you have, it's just, you know, basically you end up in a case where it's like, well, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to throw away my model and just recombine it from scratch. <laughs> in terms of performance, that's not awesome. So uh, the solution here is, you know, hey, let's do everything in after evaluate. Because, hey, after evaluate is the uh, solution and source to every problem in Gradle. Um, and so we do that. Um, and then, of course, the next step is just like execution, right? You're basically done once you're done with it after evaluate. I mean, someone else could also create after evaluate uh, callback and then do stuff there and, and then it's like, well, who does it first? And it's you know, like the whole timing issue. Um, we did want to have developers be able to configure the variant, right? Because even though we have a lot of things in build type and in product flavor that allow developer to say, well, you know, I have a debug specific dependency that I apply to all of my variants that are of type debug, you know? Um, and we have that for resource dependency code and all of that, you know, sometimes developers tell us, well, for that particular variant, you know, I do want to do something special for that. So the way we did that is, uh, so we have this application variant API, which, you know, is a bit magic because all here is fantastic, right? During the parsing of the DSL, we basically just record a closure saying, for every item of that collection now and future, just configure it. So this is passed ahead of time, and then later, during after evaluate, as, you know, our plugin creates those combinations, and create the variant, and we want they're ready. We add them to the um, to the collection, and then your closure gets called, and you can do whatever you want. Um, but the problem is that it's not very granular, right? It's like you know we have a single one of them, and so our variant really, you know, we combine the uh, you know build type and product flavor. We create the task, we do everything, and then we give it to you to do stuff. Uh, what if you wanted to customize it before we create the task? Well, you can't. Uh, what if you wanted, you know, and so. There's no granularity to it. Um, and if we wanted to introduce that granularity, we'd just need to have like several of those application variant API, as many as you want. And then, well, where do we stop really? Um, so just to give you some ideas of what a standard Android project look like, right? So uh, by default, you get two build types, debug and release. Um, and so you actually get five variants instead of just two. So you have debug, you have release, then we have uh, testing variants, to do unit tests, so you have one for debug and one for release. And then we get an actual on-device test, we call instrumentation test variant, that will create a different Android application that can go and run tests on a device. Uh, we have only one of those for now. It's always associated with the uh, debug um, version because we can't really test the release. By default, in a lot of cases, uh, the regular developer does not have access to the release signing key anyway, and so you know, the release is rarely signed and, and used directly. But if you created a QA or beta version, you would also not testing. It's something that we need to improve. And then we get 115 plus tasks. And I say 115 plus because it's like, as I said earlier, there's like, you know, ProGuard is optional, Multidex is optional. We have a lot of flow that will actually, if you enable them, create even more tasks. Um, if you have two flavors, well, it's basically double, right? So we have 10 variants. So again, you two flavors and two build type gets you four different versions of your app, four versions of the unit test, and then only the debug version, so two of them gets tested. Uh, and then 210 tasks. Um, and just to give you some uh, you know, point of reference, a pure Java project has about 15 tasks, and that's it. Um, so I wanted also to talk a little bit about dependency because for us it's a huge problem. Um, so dependencies in Android is a little bit particular, right? So we do have jar dependency. You can say, hey, I depend on Guava or whatever, and it just works. But um, our mechanism to handle Android resources is a little bit particular. I mentioned earlier that it creates uh, uh, 
Java code and things like that. So to actually have a dependency that provides not only Android code but Android dependencies, we kind of had to figure something out. So we have what we call ARs, which are basically a zip file that contains some Java code, potentially some native code, some SOs, uh, and then some resources and additional files like program file, manifest, and things like that. Um, and then those also can have dependencies either on other ARs or on regular Java files. Uh, so jars are easy, right? It's like when you're compiling something, you just give, hey, I have 20 jars. Whether there's actually transitive dependencies or all of your 20 jars are direct dependencies doesn't really matter. You get the flat list and you send that to the class pass of Java C and it just works. For ARs though, that works for code also, but for resources, we have an override mechanism. And so if you have transitive dependencies, you know, um, deeper dependency get overridden potentially by, you know, sh uh, sh uh, shallower one, I guess. And so uh, we do need to handle that as a graph. Uh, and the other thing, I mentioned that it's a zip file, so we do need to unzip it. And that's actually a big issue for us. Uh, so, and then, you know, I know that the provided scope is actually, re you know, there's a couple of bugs of people requiring that for Gradle. So we really needed it, so we added that. So we have uh, provided package only and uh, compiled dependencies. And you have that for every single uh, build type and flavor. So if you want the debug specific dependency, you can do that. If you want a provided only specific dependency for like your Google version, you could do that. And so we end up creating composite um, configuration that just do like extend from, from like all of those dependencies and we create two of them, compile and package per variant. Um, and so when you have a regular project with five variants, you have 10 of those configuration. And if all you do is compile and you add a dependency, let's say a retrofit, uh, you're going to have 10 of those composite configurations that all have the same content. But we do have to resolve every single one separately because we do need to make sure that, you know, we resolve and the resolution strategy that potentially you put in place is for that particular variant. So at every, uh, every time you compile, you know, you have to go and resolve all of those 10 different ones um, separately, even though potentially they contain the same thing that you don't really know. So the other thing that you need to do, uh, which is a little bit painful, is uh, the API for getting information about dependencies is not really great in Gradle right now. Um, you know, like if you do a regular Java plugin, all you do is like your configuration.get file and it gets resolved and you get the flat list and you're done. But for us, we need the graph. So there's two different ways to get access to it. So first we do a flat access with that, like get resolved configuration, get resolved artifact, which gives us the artifact plus an identifier and then using the other one, get incoming, get resolution result, get root, we actually get the graph. And on each item, we can call the dependencies. But here, all we get is the identifier. So we have to then link it back to the flat version that we got to figure out with wh what the artifact is. So we have to do that. Uh, we do have to do it for both configs, so I said that already. Um, the local dependencies are handled completely differently, so it's another third API. And then, and then the big thing that we're doing is that we're processing that, uh, for example, we don't actually support provided for AR, so we have to compare the, the two, uh, for each variant, we have to compare the compile and the package uh, to figure out what's going on. And then, um, you know, there's also, uh, yeah. if you have a test dependency, we need to do some work also. So if you have a test app and a tested app, we have to compare the two graphs to make sure that if you have the same artifact, let's say again, retrofit, it's the same version, right, which it could not be if you had some weird transitive dependencies. And if it's the same version, then we have to actually remove it from the test app so that um, you know, the class pass only contain one version of your artifact. Um, and so um, I'm saying all of that because what we end up with is you know, we have a, like a big internal project at Google that has 450 Gradle modules and it takes two minutes to do evaluation. And 45 seconds of that is the actual dependency handling, right? Where we do the resolution and we do all that. And that's because we have to do it during the, evalu the, the evaluation because of that task that needs to be an archive, right? We want one task per dependency. We don't want to unarchive everything, otherwise you, you don't get, especially with the upcoming uh, parallelism for task, we want to ha have tasks that are as granular as possible. And so, because we have to create that task, in terms of life cycle, really, it's like, if you need to create tasks, you need to do it in the evaluation phase. And if you're doing it in the evaluation phase, because right now there's no life cycle, you have to do everything. And every time you do evaluation, you need to make sure everything is ready for whatever it is that you're doing. So even if you call Gradle help, which does not care at all about any task that you create, you still have to resolve your dependencies. You still have to do everything. So it's really a big problem for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, when a lot of Android developers complain that Gradle is slow, uh, even though you know, we do have a lot of work to do on our side because we have a lot of actual compile steps that are also slow, uh, whether you're using Gradle or the bytecode conversion from Java bytecode to our own 
custom bytecode, uh, you know, Gradle also sometimes takes two minutes to be, set, to be ready to say, hey, okay, I'm ready to build, let's actually run some tasks. All right. Um, Configure on demand is actually the only help that we have right now. Uh, it definitely helps for multi-modules, uh, but the big issue is that we have a lot of developers who are actually using variants, and then that actually is, is slow, and so the new component model will help for that too. Uh, all right, so that new component model, uh, we're super excited about it. Uh, again, if you haven't seen uh, Luke's talk, you should definitely uh, watch it, it's really awesome. Uh, and then the, the workshop also, I think, was recorded. Um, so the idea here is, you know, only do what's needed, you know, provide a way for Gradle to understand your model so that Gradle can decide what can be done and what doesn't need to be done, um, cache what has not been changed or keep it live in the daemon, and also provide a better way for other plugin to extend your plugin by adding very clear and specific rules about what they want to change in your model. Um, that's what I just said. Um, so there's, um, and all of that is done by, you know, annotation processing, uh, annotation on, on task. It doesn't do annotation processing, I think. Um, and there's also, uh, I think they talked about it very shortly during the workshop, uh, about the new software model that's coming up, where you have the idea of a, a component uh, that generate binaries and things like that. Uh, we're kind of still, you know, looking at what we want to do. I think, you know, Gradle will allow you long term when they move completely to that model to say, in my project, I want to have a Java component and then a native component and, and they have kind of like their own task and they don't interfere with each other necessarily. They create their own binaries and things like that. Uh, for Android here, you know, we kind of like, you know, it's complicated enough. We kind of, we would prefer to not actually enforce that, you know, allow people to create, this is an Android project, but I also have a Java, pure Java component and then a native component. Um, so we kind of want to keep a unique Android component and we can't really reuse Java component as is because it doesn't really work for us. Um, and component also have their own source set and language transform and all of that. And because of the way we handle all of that, we, right now, at least we still kind of do our custom stuff. Uh, but we do use the concept of binary, and so basically a binary for us is a variant. Uh, so we'll see that uh, later. But that's likely to change as the API uh, change when we need it. So the first thing we needed to do was to, okay, actually model what our current model is going to look like in that new component model way. So our model is really like, there's two aspects of a model. There's the input model, right? Um, and there is the... Uh, the model that's generated from it. So um, on the left side here, well, th that big green box is really what a developer would configure, right? So um, there's the build type, which, you know, developer will go in and say, hey, I need three build types, and this is the configuration. There's different fla flavors, uh, and here I represent two different dimensions with different elements in those, uh, but you could have as many as you want, and, and by default you have zero, actually. And there's option is really like just other properties that we need, you know, what kind of API you want to access and, and things like that, like packaging options. We actually have a lot of, of options. So what we looked at is how do we get from there to the binary, right? So we have, um, it's relatively simple. Basically, you want to go from the left side to the binary and then the binary create the task. All the arrows here are meant to create sort of like, to represent sort of a mutate rule. Uh, there's actually quite a, a few more than just those, but it's to simplify things. So we kind of combine the flavor into flavor combination, which has like every possible combination of all flavors. Uh, and then that plus the build type gets into variant binary, or, or variant or binary. Uh, the um, options do affect both the binary and the, uh, and the task. Uh, for example, like if you enable ProGuard, then you'll get additional uh, information, additional tasks. Uh, so they, they configure a whole bunch of stuff that's why they're in terms of mutate. So here, it's actually great, right? Because we can encode saying, you know, some of those properties are input both for creating a variant and creating a task. And then we have that internal model here, which is, I did not want to, to spend too much time like putting that. We have a lot of, whoa, okay. Um, sorry about that. Should I quit that? Um, so, um, yeah, so that internal model, well, we also, you know, it's very much a work in progress on our end. And, um, you know, we are trying to kind of like, it, it's, we're creating a new plugin, right? We're trying to not just replace the current plugin right now because that would be a little bit crazy. So we're kind of sharing a lot of code. So there's a lot of models that are kind of like internal st stuff in order to allow us to not, um, completely fork all of the code, right? We have a lot of different type of tasks. You know, I mentioned earlier, like 100 tasks. Uh, a lot of them have different type and different configurations. So we're kind of trying to reuse the code. So we have some model here 
that uh, maybe long term will disappear and be more uh, be handled separately, but we have a, a few of them. And you'll see them when I show you a bit of the, some of the rules that we have. Uh, so the first rule that we have is uh, this one, right? That's the very basic one. So we're using manage typed. Uh, if, you, if, you looked at, uh, if you went to the workshop yesterday, um, so this is the way you create a manage type. So here we're basically saying, I want an Android uh, element in my model. And that's like our entry point for everything, the same way we had an Android uh, extension. Um, and so Android model is a managed you know, interface. So we say, hey, you know, there it is. And then in it, we just have a bunch of you know, setters and getters. Um, and so uh, you know, one of them, for example, get compile SDK version, that's just a string saying which version of Android you want to compile. Um, it's a string because, well, it's a string. I, I'll talk about that actually in a minute. Uh, then you have um, default config, build type, get product flavor. So here we use the collection, the model map, right, that allows us to manage those collections. Uh, if you actually go and look, uh, uh, dig into the product flavor and the build type, you'll see that it's also a managed interface. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of unmanaged stuff, actually. Uh, we want to get rid of them at some point. Um, there's various reasons why we have them. Um, one of them is that we can't really have special setters. And so full revision is just like a class to manage like a revision of a version of stuff that we have in the SDK. And we don't want the developer in the uh, DSL to say, you know, um, build to revision equal an actual full revision object. We want to just pass a string and have all code pass it and convert it into full revision. And it's something that we do in the current DSL, but it's something that we cannot do here. And it's the same thing for the uh, compile SDK version. Um, there are some times when you compile with versus Android where the target, compilation target, is actually a string because it's like it's an add-on or things like that. But in most cases, it's just an integer. What's the API level, right? Right now it's 22. And so in, in our version, we have two versions of it. We have a set uh, compile SDK version that will receive a string and one that received an integer and we convert the integer to the string when we need. And here we can't really do that, right? So it's something that we are, we're working with the Gradle team to, um, to have more flexibility to control the DSL. Um, we use defaults a lot, right? So we do create default build types, uh, debug and release. And so um, here you have an example, right? It's just a default rule. Uh, we receive the model type, uh, we receive the model map of build, of build type, and we just add the two of them. We do additional stuff like setting properties, you know, like one of the difference between those two is one is debuggable, the other one isn't, so we also set those booleans. I removed it for, for clarity here. Um, and it finds the model map uh, build type here because we have only one item in our model that actually is a model map of build type, so we don't have to do the add path thing. Uh, we used to do it. I think technically we still do it, but normally we don't need it because we have a single uh, collection of, of build type. Uh, same thing for product flavor. So here, that's um, the model that we had just here, right? That's the flavor combo, just right of the, of the green stuff. Uh, you know, here we just say, hey, we have a model. It's a list of that new type, product flavor combo, and it's created from the list of model maps. So here, we know that this will be called only when all the flavors have been created. And it's something that the previous uh, mechanism didn't really allow us to do. As we passed the DSL, we just didn't know when, when we had passed and modified every flavor. We, there was no feedback. And here we know that when that gets called, all the flavors have been configured. You know, we are ready to actually create the combination of it. Um, so I mentioned that we, do, uh, we use the binary mechanism as a variant. And so uh, this is you know, how we define saying, hey, this is our implementation of the binary. Um, you know, it's the annotation that's a bit different from the actual model uh, stuff. It's more the software model than the uh, than the uh, the mutate rule, and then and then we create our binary uh, again with a slightly different uh, uh, annotation. And here, so you know, it, it works the same. Where where the subject is the first item, so that's the model map of binaries, and then uh, the arguments are the stuff that comes with it. And so here we have build types. We have flavor combos, right? That's the combination of all the flavors. And we have this Android component spec, which kind of gives us a access to uh, all the other properties that we had in our model. Because this is, you know, that's what we needed, right? We need the build type, all the various properties, and that. And, and so in here, we'll just do basically binaries.create. Uh, well, we loop on all the build types, and we loop on all the flavor combos. And for each of them, each combination, we do a, uh, you know, binaries.create, and, and then we set up stuff. Um, and then we create the task. Uh, so here, um, you know, the subject is the list of tasks, 
and then we have, uh, you know, the input is the binary, we have the spec also, and then we have task manager, which is one of those internal models that, you know, uh, that will probably change when we, uh, as we move further. So the tasks are pretty good, you know, uh, in this new model. They're very lightweight. Uh, you know, when you do create with a name, that's really all it does. It doesn't actually run your closure, so it's very lightweight. And so since we configure so many tasks, you know, that's very useful to not have to configure them. Um, the question, though, is, you know, how much less are we really doing, right? Because our model is fairly complicated. Computing it takes a lot of time. But if you look at, you know, you kind of have to look backward, right? You set up your model saying, you know, model A, you know, is mutated, but then at some point I create model B from model A, and then I create model C from some other models, and then, and then at the end I create my binary, and then I create my task. But the way Gradle does it is kind of like backward, where it will say, on the command line you say Gradle, and you say assemble something, and then it says Gradle has, in order to know what to do, it has to have realized this list, that, that model map of tasks. And so in order to have done that, it actually needs to do every single binary. And so the only thing right now that you benefit from is you're only going to really configure the task that you are going to run, which is great, but you're still going to create every single binary. Uh, and that's because right now there's no caching, there's no keeping it, uh, the model in the, in the daemon. Um, and so right now you have to recreate everything, which uh, you know, when we get to some performance number, you'll see is actually it's still faster, but it's not as fast as we can go. And so, you know, as soon as we can cache stuff or keep it live in the daemon, that will be even better. Uh, but right now, that, that's not the case. Um, so another thing interesting here on the task is, you know, we use convention mapping a lot, uh, even though Luke yesterday said we shouldn't, but we do because that's all we can do. And so convention mapping, for those who are not aware, is, you know, a way of, of configuring inputs of a task, not when you do configure the task, but when it's ready to run, right? So that's the just in time, right? And so the prime is that Gradle seems to call the closure that you pass like more than once, uh, like very early on, and then just before your task is run. And so uh, it's it's very lazy, but it's not cached, and so it calls it all the time. Now, in comparison, the new mechanism is as soon as Gradle is creating the task graph of the task that will actually run, it will go and actually configure every one of those tasks. Some problem that we're having is that it's. Um, in our case, we have a lot of tasks that has an input, an output of another task. And so in all of our closure where we you know, do convention mapping, we end up you know, looping through a bunch of stuff in our model saying, well, potentially we have all of those jar files, but maybe they exist or maybe they don't. But we know that by the time we run that closure, it, they, they will, either they exist and they will always exist, or if they don't exist, they will never exist. And so we just test it now. When you do ahead of time configuration, you're actually not sure whether they exist or not. And the at input uh, or at input files, at input file on, on task uh, tend to be very, uh, um, very strict. Like the file has to exist, even though you can put add optional. From what I tried, add optional is really like either the class field exists or it doesn't. So it, uh, it does not exist, right? Sorry. Either the field is set to a value or it's null. But if the field exists and points to a file, that file must exist, or Gradle will tell you input file blah, does not exist. So then you have to be a bit more careful about what you're doing so that as you're configuring those tasks ahead of time, if the input are actually output of other tasks, you have to find a way to, uh, to do that. Uh, so that's a little bit tricky. I think we're, we're still working through that. Um, so the DSL, um, you know, yesterday during the workshop and during the, the talk, they mostly talked about like you know how you create those mutate rules and you know default and finalize and all of that. They talked very little about the DSL, which for us is actually super important, right? Because we do want the DSL to be really good, and we are going to migrate a lot of users from our current DSL to the new DSL. And you know, I was talking to Ken, who's writing a book on Android, and it's like you know, it was like great, everything's going to change, and, and we don't want everything to change. We you know, like the model stuff is really the only thing that we would like to change, but it's quite not there yet. Um, so as I said earlier, there's no custom setters for task, right? For, for type. If in your model you have a setter that receives a type, you know, the TSL expects that you will provide an instance of that type rather than like a string that then you know you can convert to that type uh, for, you know, you know, which would be better for the developers, right? Uh, you can't automatically create a generate item, uh, and I will talk about that in a minute. So uh, we know it's a work in progress, right? Uh, we're very much ahead of a lot of Gradle developers to help the Gradle team make sure that they have something that, that can work in, in real world situation. Uh, so I'm not worried, but it's kind of like the current situation. So if we look at the DSL right now, 
On the left is the old one, and on the right is the, the new one. Um, so it looks almost the same, and you know, everything is under our model, you know, and that's because Gradle will manage everything that's under that. Uh, and for basic stuff like compile SDK version, you know, it just works. Uh, so you will notice that on the right, there's an equal 21, and on the left, there isn't. Actually, one of the issues that we have is that we wanted to give a lot of flexibility to developers because, hey, Gradle lets you do that. That's awesome. So in the old model, we both have on our extension a set compile SDK version, which receives an integer, and we have a compile SDK version method that receives an integer too. And then that allows you to either put an equal or not, depending on what you want to do. But on the right side, because it's only a setter, you have to put the equal. If you don't put it, it doesn't work. So there's a bit less uh, magic here. And maybe they'll, they'll fix that. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but there's a few things like that that are small. Um, the other part is um, the path here. We have to do that. So build type is a, there's a getter, right, inside your Android config uh, manage interface that represent like our entry point and and right now we, we kind of want it to be under the Android block directly like on the left but apparently it doesn't work yet so we have to actually put the full path of that item when you want to configure it that's kind of you know, something we're working on um, and then the other part that I mentioned is so here debug we we create by right we have a default rule where we create debug so if you want to configure it you can just do that debug you put your closure just works. Um, but if you want to create a new one, you kind of have to call create, which is basically the same that you would do in code, where you would do, you know, the model map of build type dot create, and then something, and then, a, uh, you know, a closure to configure it. Um, so on the left, you don't have to do that. When it finds foo, or when it finds debug, you know, the domain object container thingy, uh, will either say, well, if it's not there, I create it, or if it's there, I just allow you to create it. Um, and then we have some other challenges that uh, are very probably very specific to Android. Uh, for example, right now, like the same way you do create here on Foo, you could technically somewhere under model, you could do create of, you know, whatever name you want, and you do command, you pass a type. So you could put Android config to say, hey, I want another instance of an Android config model object. Why not? I don't know what we would do with it, but people could do it, uh, and they could do it anywhere in there, and, you know, I feel like, for, you know, then you get, potentially, you could get a weird error message because depending on how you set up your rules, right, and we saw that yesterday during the workshop where there was that person model and, you know, you have a rule that expects a single person and then you create manually two instances of that model and then Gradle doesn't know what to do with the rule because the rule expects one instance of person but you just created two so it doesn't know which one to give you. So the fear here that we have is if you, a low developer to create a second one, they're going to get some weird error saying, well, I can't apply rule blah with a name that's completely internal that developer don't know. Uh, and so for us, it's important that, you know, we have a way of saying, well, this, I want only one instance. I don't want to allow anyone to in instantiate another version of that model object and have a clear or message saying, you're not supposed to do that, right? Um, and then same thing for pass restriction. You know, there's, you know, some places where you could create things with a different pass. And, you know, so we want to make sure that you can't do that uh, because for us, we have that model. It's a fairly complex model. It's not just like, a, you know, like yesterday, the two person, first name, last name, that's easy. For us, we have really like a lot of different model objects that interact with each other and want to make sure that developers don't do the right thing and get a weird error message, right? Here, it's all about error message. I'm, we're actually super happy that, you know, the new Gradle model allows us to have much better error message because, I mean, who hasn't, you know, tried to use a plugin and you do something weird that the plugin doesn't expect and you get an error message that's like, what? I don't know what that is, you know? And clearly something is wrong, you're using it badly or whatever, but you actually, you, the error message is not obvious, right? And so we really want to do, uh, we want, we, you know, we're super happy that there's good error message, we just want to make sure that there's all the error message that we can do. Uh, and then the last point is, you know, I mentioned we have a bunch of internal model. The last thing I want to do is developer going to look at our code because it's open source and say, oh, look, there's that object. Why don't I create one myself? And it's like, no, no. Right, those are internal models that are created. Like the flavor combo, product flavor combo, is not something that developers should go and instantiate themselves. Right? We don't want people going and doing crazy stuff. So, so we kind of want a, some uh, flexibility there. So let's look at some benchmark. Um, so here, the first sample that we have is a 10 project, 25 variant each. Um, and so uh, with the old plugin running Gradle 2.4 and the new plugin running uh, 2.5, like a nightly of 2.5. Um, so it's much faster um, and 
it, it's kind of, you know, so the assemble one, every time you'll see an assemble line, it's actually running with dry run. So all the time that you see is actually just Gradle itself managing the task graph and things like that. It's not our compilation steps do because those don't really matter. So um, clearly it's much faster. Um, and you see that there's actually a difference between just running help, which really should not do anything, and actually compiling something where it's actually building the task, configuring them, and, and stuff like that. Um, the other example is, is one where, you know, that's more interesting is, you know, the 400 variant where really, you know, I said earlier with like two variants, it's like there's like 110 tasks. So here you can imagine the number of tasks that we create, right? So uh, we get a pretty good gain. There's still actually 2.4 seconds is actually fairly slow to me. And that's, you know, that's because Gradle still have to parse your DSL file and you know, kind of read it and you know, do some things there. And as you can imagine, actually creating 400 variant is a lot of code. You know, we, I think it's set up as like 20 build type and 20 flavors, and so it's creating the binaries anyway. So it's still doing things, and you know, I'm hoping that with either the cache, uh, reloading cache from disk, or keeping it live in the daemon, we can get rid to it and have a startup cost of zero. Um, and then the other uh, project that we have here is, uh, so it's 120 project, Android project. So the, the settings file actually contains 120 project, but because there's like path and, and like every parent path is a Gradle project, it's actually 240. So help is uh, even faster. You know, we go from 9.5 to 2.8, which is awesome. And then assemble is really also a good gain, right? It's, it's slower than help, but compared to the old plugin, it's actually, you know, faster. So the trick here um, is, you know, I mentioned convention mapping, and I was talking to, that, to Luke yesterday. Um, if you actually apply, uh, sorry, not convention mapping, convention on demand, configure on demand. Um, if you actually run configure on demand, it's actually a lot faster. <laughs> As you can see, you know, uh, the old plugin with 2.6 seconds is actually faster than the component model without configure on demand. And that's uh, because right now, they, uh, apparently the issue is that they still have to go and look at all the project to see what's going on there, whether there's rules or what's applied to them and things like that. Um, so it's still, you know, and I see it when I run that from the command line, even with the new plugin, I see Gradle kind of like go through every single, you know, you say configure, but it doesn't actually do anything because I put some warning in all of my project and, and it doesn't output the warning for all the project with the component model. It just outputs it for the, uh, the project that are built. Uh, and here I built, you know, I built like 13 projects out of 120. And so it's really, with the new component model, it will really only run and configure the one for uh, those 13 projects that I'm building but it still goes sort of and look at the old ones, which is not uh, something that it, they want to do. Once we get to a point where everything is using the new model, then you know, Gradle will just ignore the other project, but that's not the case right now. So if you have like a big project, configure on demand is still useful if you know that no project goes and poke and change the model of another project, uh, which if you're using the component model, shouldn't happen anyway. And then uh, when we build everything, we see that it's basically about the same time anyway because you know, we have to almost configure everything. Um, so actually, you know, the difference between those two, like the 14.2 and the 13.1 is uh, you know, right now, you know, I mentioned that we spend so much time resolving all dependencies, well, we still do. Because there, there we're still, you know, um, you know, even though everything is faster and it's great, we're not quite there. You know, they, we're lacking APIs to do a good job about handling our dependencies, creating tasks to unzip and prepare some of our dependencies are they're coming. So right now, we still resolve all of them ahead of time. Uh, you know, and we resolve them during the creation of the binary. So that's the step that I was saying earlier is always done anyway. It's only the tasks that are not done. So we want to, we're lacking so, like a, a life cycle where we can be after the binaries are created. Uh, we want to be able to basically do the resolution when we know which binary will actually be built. But by that time, we need to still be able to add tasks to the graph. So we are, we're kind of missing something just between the, uh, my binary is ready and my tasks are, are ready to, uh, to go. Uh, so, so we are working through that with them. Um, and then, so I mentioned no caching, better DSL. Uh, but overall, you know, we're, we're working very closely with the Gradle team. Uh, we're super happy with the progress that they've made. Uh, you know, we are actually planning to ship that in a couple of weeks. Um, and, and put that in the hand of developers and, and see you know, what they think. I think we're not going to get a lot of um, people really migrating right away because the DSL is not there yet. But uh, it also will come with the pure uh, native support, which we don't have right now, so people will use it for that. Uh, and 
That's it. Questions? Yes. Yes, so, you know, so uh, the question is, you know, when we released it, will it be a preview? Um, what we did a while back is that we kind of like split our current plugin into a core internal stuff and like the current front end, and then we create a new front end for it. So we actually have two plugins. We have the existing one that will not change, that will keep shipping for quite a while, and then we'll have a separate plugin, a second plugin that will be, yeah, because we don't want to break everyone. So we'll have a second plugin that's only for the new component model, and we'll keep doing that for quite a while until the API is in Gradle stabilized, we have everything we want, and we're happy. And they also tell us that it's good to go, API won't break, you can ship a production quality uh, version. Exactly. That's actually better than the second yes. So uh, the question is about uh, compile SDK version and whether it could be overridden by at the product flavor or build type. Um, <laughs> yes, there is actually a bug open on our tracker for that. Um, we haven't quite made a decision. It, it's, to be frank, it's not a question that's related to the component model, right? That's something that we could also do in the old plugin. Um, we haven't quite made the decision whether we want to go there or not, um, but we are still thinking about it. We could, we could have. Because it makes sense, right? Like there's people using flavors for, uh, for different, like one for like an older version of Android and one for a newer version of Android. If the Lint will do check API for you to make sure you don't use things you shouldn't be using, um, it could. Uh, we need to see the impact also in, um, in, the, uh, in the ID, because we do send that information to the ID. And you know, that model, which is, you know, uh, a lot of developers are telling us that they're really happy with that model. And then you open that in Studio or in Eclipse, and you know, those IDs have no concept of variant, and they have a lot of limitation there, so we want to make sure that we don't break the ID if we do that. But we are thinking about it. Other question? Nope. Yep. Any, uh, any question? Nope. All right, thank you. Oh, actually, there's one here. So the new model, do you guys have any plans to bring in network caching? Network caching? Yeah. Well, so uh, network, so the question is whether we're going to bring network caching. That's kind of, we're hoping Gradle will do it, right? <laughs> because, um, which is an easy way out, I guess. Um, it's, you know, once Gradle manage your, you know, your actual model in, in, uh, instances and all of that, you know, and Luke kind of talked a little bit about that uh, yesterday, you know, they can do a lot of things with it. You know, they can keep it in the daemon, they can reload it from cache, they can do incremental update to it when they see that a few things uh, was updated in, the, uh, in your build gradle that only affect part of your model. They can do a lot of really smart things. And, uh, and it just makes sense for gradle to be the one to control that. And I know Hans has told me that they wanted to have distributed cache and things like that. And you know, why have us do it when they're going to do that for every managed model? Right, so that's kind of the goal of Gradle actually owning your, ma your model because that's the whole point of the new APIs, right? It's like you tell Gradle, this is my model, please take care of it for me. And then they can do a lot of things directly rather than have every plugin author do it and potentially do it differently, do it well, do it badly. It's like, let's just have Gradle do it right for everyone and everyone benefit from it. But we would love to see that, obviously. So the question is about, have we done any uh, benchmark with the new component model and Jack and Jill? There's actually, you know, and that's why actually all of my uh, benchmarks here you know, do run with dry run because really whether the task is slow or fast behind doesn't really matter in that particular case, right? So whether Jack and Jill is faster than Java C, you know, we're working on that, uh, but it's not impacted by the component model. It doesn't actually matter, right? It's like once the task is created by Gradle, then the task runs and that's it. So it's, it's really a different problem. And the component model will not make any of the tasks actually faster. It just makes configuring them and preparing them to run faster, which is, you know, like right now, sometimes you say Gradle assemble and it, you know, for 20 seconds nothing happens and then it starts building, right? It's, it's only meant to fix that part. Uh, 
Okay, so, so, so the question is about you know, whether Jack requires the whole multimodal to be one or the other. That's not actually true uh, because, uh, I mean, we, we can talk about that after since it's not super related to the model. Because um, like the AR anyway always contain a Jack, a jar code, it never contained like the intermediary Jack format. So that's not really, that's not true. And then really it doesn't really have any impact. And technically you could have, if you have a multimodule project, you know, the, unless you're doing something really bad that you shouldn't be, which is like, hey, project B sort of depend on project or of the evaluation of project B. And then so that when you evaluate project A, you know that project B is created and then you go and tweak stuff there. Like, you know, project, you know, path dot, you know, tasks dot, you know, hey, let me change your task and let me tweak stuff, which really you shouldn't be doing. Um, if, you're, if you're not doing that, then you could have a single project that's using the old way and the other module that's using the new component model. It doesn't really matter. They should only communicate through exposing artifacts to the other anyway. And those artifacts are not impacted by how the model is handled. So it shouldn't matter at all. Any other question? No. All right, thank you everyone.